Hello, this is Nitin Dahad with EE e. Times, and I'm here with Peter Clark, freelance journalist and curator and creator of the Silicon 100 list uh, with from EE e. Times. Hi, Peter. Hello, Nitin. So we're going to talk about uh, this, which is the version 22 of the list and the third year in which you provide a list of 100 startups worth following. So can you tell me uh, what are the top three trends that you've seen in this latest Silicon 100 list? Three trends. Uh, well, I would say one, which is kind of concerning in a way, is funding, ample funding, that's great, without payback for the VCs. And that's a little bit worrying. We're seeing a lot of money coming into hardware. It has been for, for I don't know, best part of a decade. But... Um, Despite some, you know, the creation of many unicorns, companies with a valuation of over a billion dollars, uh, we're yet to see uh, many big payouts for the VCs. So ultimately, that's not sustainable. So something's going to have to change. But we'll, it hasn't changed this year. So there we go. That, yeah. That's one trend. The second one I would uh, say would be um, perhaps the, the fragmentation of the, the digital processing field. Um, it's a long time since we had uh, a very simple risk versus CISC battle in general purpose processors, but um, the, the number and variety of, of different types of hardware accelerator, AI processor for the, for the data center, for the edge, it's becoming a very rich and fragmented field, uh, which is interesting. That kind of links into a couple of other ideas. One we're seeing uh, are some novel ideas like... Uh, computation in memory and and the use of analog signals for computation um, which is uh, indeed a, a throwback 50 60 years the other thing the third trend I would say is the the rising significance of optical uh, processing um, which allows for a great deal of bandwidth uh, Photons don't have mass, and this is the advantage they have over electrons. So uh, we're seeing a few optical processing companies coming forward. They will probably manifest themselves in, in hybridized systems, but uh, they could well uh, have a big impact. And um, the other thing I would note is that there seems to be a sort of mutual dependency, which may be to the benefit of, of optical, AI, and quantum. We're seeing those three things increasingly go together as, as systems come to market. Interesting. And in the analysis, actually, um, you see that uh, about half the companies were formed around 2016 stroke 17, which for a startup, you know, sounds like it's a long time ago. What does, tell, what does that tell us about the nature of incubating and growing semiconductor startups? Well, particularly deep tech, uh, materials based, hardware based companies can take a long time to to come to market. Uh, the Silicon, Silicon 100 includes companies, I think, from 20, founded in 2013 right through to some that were founded in 2020. We, we don't like to rush companies onto the list because for the first couple of years at least, most of them will be in what is uh, commonly known as stealth mode, which means they're not going to be particularly easy for our readers to follow. So we, we tend to, as we become aware of them, we, we tend to check that they are getting to the position where they're going to be making some news and, and become closer to market and worth following. And uh, I say for some of these companies, it, it can be four or five years. Okay. And as a follow on, you said that the semiconductor technology scene has reached relative stability. Uh, can you explain that a little? Well, this is my perception, but um, we have a lot of very rich technologies that are being worked on by startup companies. I'm thinking of things like quantum computing, AI and machine learning, quantum uh, materials. Uh, we've got compound semiconductors, silicon carbide and gallium nitride for power. And these have been a w around a while. They, they haven't yet made any great fortunes for, for, for companies or their investors. But what we haven't had in the last year is the sort of arrival of a new technology or a new killer app. And uh, I, I wonder if it is to do with the COVID pandemic and the way that perhaps suppressed uh, networking. Um, you, you may remember that we used to have the CES show in Las Vegas yes. every January 
and people would go there and some sort of consensus would be formed that the following year would be all about the dot, dot, dot. Now, you know, that may have been, uh, you know, slightly uh, ridiculous in a way, but it, it, this sort of consensus forming actually sort of starts to set goals for, for people and for companies. And we haven't seemed to have that for the last couple of years. So we're, we're left with, with companies still have plenty on their plate trying to make successes of these, uh, these, these technologies which I mentioned before. Well, in, in which case, my next question is probably going to be a very simple answer. You mentioned you know, quantum computing being uh, sort of quite uh, uh, big in terms of interest. Any thoughts on the prospects for these startups? Um, most of them will fail, is uh, the almost inevitable conclusion, because uh, there are literally hundreds of startups that are aiming to be the next, the best thing since sliced bread in quantum computing. The majority of those companies are soft, software oriented, um, but there are very, still very large numbers, maybe 50 or so, who are hardware oriented. They cannot all succeed, that's just the, the nature of it, but it, it is such a big prize. Uh, I think most uh, experts and, and, and people who are looking, looking on this scene are agreed, quantum computing will um, have a, a very large effect on uh, how compute, computation is done and how different problems are solved, and it will have a big economic uh, impact as well. So uh, we wait to see who the winners might be, but um, for the moment, I think we have something like five or f five companies on our list who are quantum computing hardware companies who we think are definitely uh, worth following. There may be others that will arrive in years to come. Yeah, but it's just going to be, it's going to take time. Yeah. You, you touched on a few areas, um, like processors and optics and powers. Uh, are there any particular areas that we should note in terms of activity? I know there are trends, but any times in terms of activity that you've seen? Well, I, I think I'm, we mentioned the optical one. Um, I, I guess at the moment, the latest hot trend is quantum computing. Um, and that's definitely on the way up. Um, I think the theme a year ago was that maybe we, we were starting to see a peak of activity in, in AI and ML. Uh, th this peak may last for several years, um, but, but we're starting to see, uh, say, a lot of fragmentation there. So there may be the scope for, for multiple companies to succeed there. Again, if we go back a few years, people just kind of assumed that digital that the processing would be digital. Uh, that assumption is starting to be challenged now. We're seeing quite a few companies who are looking to do processing in the analog domain and, and novel techniques like computing in memory, uh, which is well matched to some of the demand for, for ML uh, machine learning. So there, there are always new little turns and twists being taken. Yeah, I, th I hear quite a lot about well, ultimately it has to interface with the analog world. So analog has to be very prevalent. Yeah, but, but I, th I think in, in the era of processing and um, the overriding um, issue is power consumption. We're, we're seeing the scaling of electronics around the world at such a high rate now that unless you are optimizing for power, you start to see um, climate change as being a limiting condition on the success of your technology. Uh, and this is definitely why being in search of greater power efficiency, silicon carbide and gallium nitride have, have come on a pace. Okay, let's switch gear. Um, everybody's got chips X, uh, well, the US and Europe, and we see other countries coming on as well. What Would that mean uh, a lot more entrance in the next two years, maybe uh, as public funding becomes available, or um, uh, is that just a misnomer? I, I, I think most of that money is definitely earmarked for capital expenditure and manufacturing and to um, provide the subsidy that will in attract companies such as Intel to Europe um, and support global foundries in Europe and to attract TSMC to the United States and to Japan and so on. So I think the vast majority, 90% of that money, is already sort of pre-allocated. It may come back to Europe when it flows into ASML, the, the equipment supplier, but um, uh, I, I don't think too much of it's going to be uh, assigned to, to design work. There, there may be some, um, but to be perfectly honest, I'd be happy if, it, if there wasn't because taxpayers' money being used to bet on 
startups doesn't usually end well. Yes, true. Uh, so finally, uh, are there any particular geographic trends you, you want to highlight? And uh, for example, you know, th there's continuing rise of China, but uh, what about California's position as well? Yes, uh, for a number of years, we've characterized uh, the, 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 the two big players uh, in, in the Silicon 100 as being California, stroke North America and, and China. That continues to be the case. Um, China continues to rise. There are now, I think, in this iteration, 20 companies headquartered in China on the Silicon 100. Um, California has dropped slightly uh, to 33. North America, I think, is 49. Hmm. But, you know, again, these, these are small changes in the numbers. And ultimately, I would say um, China has a lot of volume uh, of activity. We, we really are really only looking at, at a tip of, a, of a, an iceberg of activity in China. There are literally tens of thousands of companies being formed over there. But what the United States and what California has is kind of quality in terms of a continuous ecosystem from academic institutions, which are well set up to create startups through um, the, the sort of experienced service providers and the VC money that's available and so on. Uh, so I, I wouldn't read too much into this, um, but China is definitely got the volume. And I think the companies tend to fall into a couple of camps, two camps. One camp is those which are aiming to be domestic suppliers and to be part of the great decoupling of China from the West and from the United States. Um, others have more global aspirations and they intend to be providing engineers all around the world with uh, you know, their chosen chipset or whatever. And we, we yeah. see both of those. Well, Peter, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nitin. <laughs>